Bonjour and bienvenue. Welcome to everyone. My name is Linda Witt. I'm the president of the Fédération des Alliances Françaises, USA. I'm coming to you today from Portland, Oregon. I'm working with Melissa Soha, our national programs administrator, who is based in Washington, D.C. Melissa takes care of all the technology for our events and programs. So, Melissa, why don't you come on camera pour uh, saluer les gens? Bonjour tout le monde. Merci, merci, Melissa. So we'll get going with our slide presentation. I want to uh, go ahead and tell you first about a couple of events that we have coming pretty soon. And those are uh, starting off next Tuesday, we have an event in English. It's the authorized biography of Christian Dior. Uh, and mm. then uh, coming in January, we have Demystifying the French where we're gonna welcome Adrian back again. And this will be on a panel discussion with three other experts on cultural differences uh, between the French, of course, and, and Americans. And then if you're interested in something in French, in fact, very fast paced French, then we have an event in February with uh, Luc Delambre. He's an author and an academic, and he'll be talking about the Napoleon influence in Washington, DC. And then in March, we have the Art of Translation with, uh, with Sandra Smith, back to English again. Um, so I hope you'll consider attending any of those events. And then there's also two events that we don't have quite yet up on our website, but which will be there shortly. And I think you'll be interested in them as well. So I'll tell you about briefly about them. On December 14th, that's next month, we ha will have a live demonstration on how to make a bûche de Noël. And that's with the author of Maggie's Kitchen. And then on January 15th, we'll have an overview of the best immersion programs in France. Uh, and that uh, will include a discussion with Frédéric Laty uh, of the Institut de Français in, uh, in Villefranche. So those are uh, some of our upcoming events and you can visit them on your local uh, chapters website or the uh, AFUSA uh, website. Okay, and then we also want to tell you very briefly about a special event that we have going online between now and uh, November 23rd, and that's an online auction to benefit all the Alliance Francaises in the United States, who are, of course, all nonprofit organizations, and you're welcome to visit that, and we'll put the, the link later on in the chat, but you'll notice that um, Adrian has kindly donated uh, a consultation, so you are welcome to bid on that in the auction it will only have one winner. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> visit that site before, uh, before November 23rd. Okay, I want to talk very briefly about logistics. And uh, so here we go. Please stay on mute during the presentation. We will be using the chat feature and we encourage you to use the chat feature to submit your very general questions. I wouldn't say very general questions, but we want you to avoid um, uh, asking questions that are, that are, you know, kind of a personal or very specific nature. And then uh, just reminding you, there will be time for some additional Q&A at the end if your question isn't answered um, in the chat itself, because uh, Adrian has a colleague, Patty, who she'll be introducing shortly, who will be working with <laughs> Melissa and I um, to, uh, to help answer questions in the chat. So fire away in the chat at will. You'll want to stay on speaker view so that you can see the slides. Adrian will be sharing slides. And then, it, you know, Zoom is pretty dependable, but if you get kicked off for any reason, you can just log back on in a few minutes uh, using the same link. And then as all of you have, I think, noticed, this event is being recorded for posting on our YouTube channel. And our total runtime today will be uh, right around an hour. So it is my uh, great pleasure now to introduce Adrian Leeds, who is widely recognized as the premier expert in French property, and in fact, in the whole field of moving to France and living in the hexagon. Many of you have seen Adrienne in her role as HGTV's top French real estate expert agent on the show House Hunters International. Adrienne knows very deeply of what she speaks. She has herself <laughs> lived in France for over 27 years. She arrived in Paris in 1994 and has since devoted her efforts to assisting other expats in their quest to fulfill their dream to live in France. Her company, the Adrian Leeds Group, is a licensed real estate agency offering property consultation services primarily for North Americans and other Anglophones wanting to live and or invest in France. 
So I've had the opportunity to work with Adrian on a number of occasions over the past 10 years, and we're very grateful that she's made time in her busy schedule to share her thoughts with us today. So a very warm, warm welcome to you, Adrian. Please take it away. Oh, Linda, thank you so, so, so much. Um, thank you also to Melissa and to the Alliance Francaise uh, across the US. This is, um, it's really a pleasure for me to be here and to make this presentation. And I would like to introduce Patty Sadowskis. Maybe Patty, you can just raise your hand there. Yep. Who's uh, my personal assistant and is going to be monitoring the chat and helping to answer questions and other things. And so I think the best way for me to get started is to just share my screen and get moving. Okay, everybody see the screen? So here we go. This is our opportunity to learn how to escape to France. This is a special presentation that I put together for the Alliance Francaise Federation, and I hope that everyone enjoys it. Oh, now I have to make sure that I can switch the slides. <laughs> So the question is, okay, who we are. Um, we are property consultants. We are a licensed real estate agency in France, but we work primarily for the buyer, not the seller. And so we kind of think of ourselves as French property, the American way. We're for Americans, by Americans. And when I use the term American, it really is broad. It includes Canadians, so it's North Americans. We also work, of course, with Australians and New Zealanders and uh, other Anglophones, such as the British, but our focus is really on North America. Our uh, services include the consultation. We do search for property for both rentals as well as purchases. We do offer listings and the sale of properties, so properties that are owned by Americans that they wish to then sell. We can also assist in making a purchase or making a sale, and we do appraisals, we offer financing resources, and we have teams that do renovation and decoration. So I sort of think of it as soup to nuts, everything that's related to property. Now, if you don't already know this, uh, there's no MLS in France, and MLS stands for Multiple Listing Service. This is a service in the United States that allows every property to go on the market at the exact same time, which really makes a huge difference in the way uh, the way the system operates. I'm going to explain a little bit more about that as we go through. But what you're dealing with in France is not only is there no multiple listing service, but you've got a completely different process. You've got completely different laws. You're dealing in a different language, which hopefully you guys are really learning through the Alliance Francaise. So maybe it's not so different for you, but you've also got a different currency and there's currency exchange to deal with. You've got cultural differences. And just imagine that every single thing you deal with is different. So take everything you ever knew about real estate in the US or Canada, throw it out the window and start over. So, oh boy, I got to France. Uh, I first came as a tourist in 1979. I got hooked. I didn't want to leave. Doesn't that happen to everyone? <laughs> everyone I know anyway. And ended up moving to Paris in 1994 for a one year sabbatical to test the waters with my family and just never left. I hear that story a lot too. I did not speak French. I hadn't taken any lessons other than, you know, four years of high school French. And I have to tell you, that was a really dumb thing to do. So I want to encourage everyone out there to, you know, bone up with your Alliance Francaise and make sure that you've got some good French under your belt before you get here. At the time, I thought, okay, I'm going to land in France, take an intensive course and be fluent in three months. Ah, oh, that's a joke. Okay, there is no way to do that. Besides, once I landed in Paris, um, I didn't really want to spend all of my time in a classroom. I wanted to enjoy the city. So I ended up never 
taking any lessons. I'm ashamed to admit that, except that in order to learn French, what I did was create a French English conversation group, which I called Parlay Parlor. And it was a way for me to organically learn at least conversational French. But I also hate to admit that I still don't really read or write very well. Um, and I just want to make a note that on the lower right-hand corner of this screen is a photo of the Alliance Francaise building in Portland, Oregon, which is where I met Linda Witt because I spoke there many years ago and it was a lot of fun. Um, and the upper photo is, of course, my daughter, who is at the time, I guess she was 11 or 12 and now she's 36. What happened was though, um, when I decided to stay, I had a carte de séjour, which is a visa, and I renewed it annually for 10 years, which they would not, they would not give me any carte de résident. I had to do that every single year for 10 years, suffer through going to the préfecture, and I didn't have the right to work. But because I wanted to stay, I had to find ways of surviving. So I did a lot of different things, which of course included the French English conversation group. But I ended up working with a developer and uh, learned how to develop websites for clients. I wrote the first online restaurant guide to Paris, which even now seems incredulous with everything online for restaurants. But this was a PDF version that you you know, clicked on, downloaded, paid for, and there were 50 to 100 restaurants on it. And then in 2001, I went to work for International Living and I opened their Paris office. I did worked with them for three years and then decided to go on my own independent. So in 2004, I started my company, the Adrian Leeds Group. And of course the rest is history. So here's the deal. I'm going to warn you right now that if you move to France, you probably will never go back. It's really difficult to go in reverse in your life. And it's also really difficult to give up what France has to offer. And if you've been to France, then you know these things. I don't even have to tell you. You know, you've got this amazing beauty, architectural, landscape, style, everything, aesthetics are amazing. Then you've got this incredible amount of culture, the culinary arts, the performing arts, the creative arts. Um, I'd put Paris museums up against any city in the world. I think we have more available there than I can imagine anywhere, even New York, no offense to New York. Uh, we've got diversity. There's ethnic diversity. There's a cityscape. There's landscape in this one small country that is almost the size of Texas has as much diversity as the entire United States. There's just a lot of France to love. And then of course, there's the lifestyle, the joie de vivre, the amount of time that the French give to being able to relax and reflect on their lives. You know, rather than uh, living to work, they work to live. And it really does come through with five weeks paid vacation, 14 holidays every year and uh, the time they spend with their families. On top of that, there's an amazing safety net because their, secure, their social security system offers a very excellent and inexpensive healthcare, um, unemployment, retirement benefits. Uh, it really doesn't get better. If you're working for a company in this country, then you really, you can depend on that job almost forever. And that safety net gives people a tremendous amount of security. On top of it, they have, they really believe in education. It's very high on the list. In fact, the class levels in France are determined by your level of education. So you can get a high quality free education for both children and adults, which is a huge benefit. And then on top of that is this amazing infrastructure because the public transportation systems are sophisticated and inexpensive. The communication systems are in place. It's really rather remarkable how much this country offers its citizens, and not just citizens, its residents. 
So, okay, you know, not everything's perfect. Some taxes are higher. Income taxes particularly are higher. But property taxes are much lower. Property taxes are about one-tenth of what they are in the U.S. And in the end, you get a lot more for your money. The French don't really complain about their taxes. They do complain about their bureaucracy, but they don't complain about taxes. And in this kind of environment, there are fewer rich, but there are fewer poor, and there's a larger middle class. And that's because France offers this bigger safety net as a socialist democracy. What's interesting for you to know is that you are not taxed in France on your retirement income or investments. So when you move to France, what you have earned in the US or Canada stays there and what you earn in France stays here. So uh, believe it or not, you can arrange things so that you can live in France and pay less tax than if you were living in the States. Now, when you move here, you will have the right to health care at no cost after having been here for 90 days. So if you apply for a visa after 90 days, you can apply for PUMA, P-U-M-A, and that will pay benefits up to 70 percent. You can top that up with what's called a mutual insurance policy so that you can actually have 100% coverage with no deductible. I have a mutual uh, that does exactly that. And for my mutual is, believe it or not, about 1,600 euros a year, that's all. And I'm of a certain age. So I think it's pretty amazing. And you'll find that overall, the healthcare costs are about one-tenth of what they are in the US. And if you don't already know this, you should. The WHO has ranked France number one in healthcare in the world for many, many years. So this is a fear you need to give up, that you will get the best care you've ever had here in France. Now, as an American citizen or Canadian, you are permitted to stay 90 days within any 180 day period without obtaining a visa. For stays between four and 12 months, you can be issued a long stay visa that's equivalent to a residence permit. So that makes you a full, a full fledged resident but not a citizen. In order to acquire the carte de séjour, you just have to show that you can support yourself econo uh, economically, financially, which is SMEC or minimum wage. So it's not a very large amount. You have to show that you have accommodations in France, which is something we can help you with, of course, and that you have medical coverage, uh, at just an insurance policy, even a temporary policy. You have to also formally agree not to engage in any professional activity during your stay in France. But I want to clarify what that means. What the French government is saying is that they don't want you to take a job away from a French national. But you can continue to work for a U.S. company and be paid in the U.S. And this is something that we can also help you understand and work through in order to find a way to earn a living once you've moved into France. And of course, now so many of us can work remotely that it's, it really makes it simple. Now, I wanna make sure though, you don't confuse legal residency with tax residency. Tax residency is where you live 183 days or more, or where you consider home. But because there's a tax treaty between France and the US, you will not pay tax twice on the same income. So this is a very important thing to understand. Uh, there's a link at the bottom of this slide that takes you to the official website for France visas. It's not complicated to apply for a French visa. Go to the site, check it out. If you feel that you really want some assistance with this, we have resources, we have immigration attorneys and other people who can help you through the process. So not to worry. French, 
Um, as I said, you know, I had my ups and downs with French, but we all know it's really the most beautiful language and it's not an easy language to learn. And you all know that because you're taking courses at the Alliance Francaise. Do it now. Okay. You don't need the French in order to apply for the visa, but it will make a huge difference in how you integrate and into a truly French lifestyle. So my recommendation to you is to do as much as you can now with your classes, go as far as you can, get your level of French as comfortable as you possibly can, but do not expect to be fluent very quickly. Do not put the kind of pressure on yourself that I did because it takes a really long time to get it right. And I don't know if you've heard this expression before, but uh, in French, la meilleure façon d'apprendre une langue étrangère est sur l'oreiller. And I'm sorry for my horrible accent, but basically what that means is the best way to learn the language is on the pillow, meaning in the bedroom. So, you know, there's a lot of France to love. Uh, it's pretty difficult to even decide where you want to be. If you want to be in Paris, expect a very urban lifestyle and the highest cost of living. Paris is mostly expensive because of housing. Everything else is maybe pretty much the same, except restaurants, things like that are going to be more expensive. But of course, it's Paris. And maybe it's, you know, it's the Mecca of France. And maybe that's exactly where you want to be. Then there's Nice and the Riviera. Um, I am at this moment in my Nice apartment. Uh, I quite love being here, enjoying the sunshine. It is both urban and suburban because Nice is very much a city and it's active and vibrant and uh, it's really has almost everything Paris has to offer. But it is also a more moderate cost of living. And you have not only Nice, which is the hub, but all of the beautiful enclaves along the coast and the hilltop villages above Nice. I highly recommend visiting this. Uh, we have an awful lot of clients who are coming to Nice because property is about half the cost of Paris and it makes a big difference. Then our neighbor, Provence, is also really... Um, uh, it's a favorite of Americans, particularly, and it offers a more rural life, lifestyle and beautiful villages. And the cost of living in Provence is even less than it is in Paris and Nice. Um, but it is definitely not as urban and the access is not quite as good as being in Nice or Paris, which both have international airports. Then, of course, there are lots of other cities and in the provinces that offer wonderful lifestyle, urban, suburban, and rural at a much lower cost of living. In fact, you know, 300,000 euros can buy you a really beautiful villa in France. Um, I think you'll get a lot more property for your money in general in France than you would in North America. Now, this is my checklist. These are things that I believe you should consider when you're trying to decide where in France you'd like to be. I, I personally believe that it's really important to have a thriving American community. And that's because you're gonna make a lot of friends. When you meet the American community in France, these are people who are just like you. They are well-traveled, well-educated, open-minded, mostly politically on the left, they have the same desires you have. They have a lot of the same experiences. They're going through the same situation. And so it makes it very easy to make friends. And you're going to need people with whom you can, you know, commiserate because the cultural clashes are tough. So you want people you can depend on. And then, of course, having really good, fast and easy access to transportation. So I believe it's important to be close to an, a good airport, close to a good train hub and have good local transport. For me, I really enjoy not owning and operating a car. And not only that, but having a car in France means obtaining a French driving license, which is in itself 
a big to do. It's expensive. It's difficult. And then owning and operating a car is expensive. You know, the AAA says that owning and operating a car is a, an average of $10,000 a year. And so in France, it's going to cost more because the price of gasoline is four times what it is in the U.S. So I highly recommend living in a place where you don't need to have a car and getting out of that bubble that you've been living in. And of course, that does mean being in more urban places. Now, you do want to consider cost of living because Paris is expensive. Other places in France are a lot less expensive. You will want to decide whether you want to rent or purchase. These are all decisions we can help you make. Another aspect is whether you've got access to good not only good healthcare, but good hospitals, because when you're in an urban environment, you will have access to better hospitals than healthcare. If you're here on business, then you may wanna explore business opportunities, or maybe what you want is really cultural. Maybe you want both. These are things to think about. And then of course, language level. Do you need to be in a place where people will speak English? Or, is, or are you fluent enough in French that you can really be anywhere in France, even in La France Profonde. And uh, bottom line is urban or rural, do you want an apartment or do you want a village house or do you want a house in the countryside? And I did not even include a chateau on this slide because chateau is not what I recommend and that's a conversation we can have another time. Now, if you're trying to decide whether you should rent or buy, there's no question that when you rent, it allows a lot more flexibility. You can rent in an area and then easily cancel your lease and move to somewhere else so you can test out the waters in various neighborhoods or various cities. But keep in mind that you are paying someone else's mortgage and you can't really make a rental your own. While owning the home, of course, gives you security as a long-term investment. So we generally recommend buying if you feel confident enough to be able to do that and have the financial wherewithal, of course. With renting, leases in France are very specific. A one-year lease is a furnished rental and it comes with a 30-day cancellation. So it's a very easy out. If you rent something unfurnished, it's a three-year lease with a 90-day cancellation, except in the city of Paris, which offers a 30-day cancellation. And that's because Paris has a terrible housing shortage. So they wanna move the property faster. The laws favor the tenant, which you as a tenant might think is pretty fabulous. But because it favors the tenants, the landlords need to, they need to secure their own situation. So they're going to require some sort of hefty security, like a year's worth of rent in an escrow account or an insurance policy which is uh, provided by a couple of different companies. We recommend Garant Me and Uncle. So GarantMe.fr, Uncle.fr with a K. Uh, and these are insurance policies that believe it or not, you as the tenant take out to protect the landlord from you as the tenant not paying the rent, which seems a little bit crazy to me, but it's what makes the landlord feel secure and it costs a few extra bucks every month and it's well worth it. Now, the rental properties are not that hard to find, but they are definitely hard to secure. And we work very hard at convincing the landlords that our foreign tenants are you know, good for the rent and they're not going to squat in the property. They do favor uh, the French who have an indefinite work contract, which is called a CDI, that's gold because financially they feel really secure. So just keep this in mind uh, when you're looking at rentals. And we do offer a service to find the rental property sight unseen, so you can move right into it, or with our client who visits the properties and can make his or her own decision. When it comes to buying property in France, Anyone can purchase property in France. You do not need any kind of a special visa. 
There is no MLS. We talked about that a little bit. So every agent only has access to their own listings, not to other agents' listings. And they do not expect to split their commissions, which by the way, is about 5% included in the asking price. Now, in some areas of France, they're much more open to sharing, but not in Paris. Paris is pretty much proprietary. They don't wanna share their information, their clients or their listings or their commissions. So, you know, you have to really be careful. It's called buyer beware because the agents will say almost anything or do almost anything to make that sale. They really don't care about you as the buyer. They care more about their pocketbook and selling the property. So this is where it makes a big difference for us to be working with you. Our primary service is property finding and we can work just about anywhere in France, not just Paris, not just Nice, not just the Côte d'Azur, but really anywhere. We work with mortgage brokers who specialize in the North American buyer and financing is possible to obtain mostly if you are about 60 years old and younger, and it's not impossible for older buyers, but under certain conditions. The reason for that is because there's a life insurance policy mandatory to secure the mortgage. And that life insurance policy becomes very expensive as you get older. So they want the mortgage to actually end by the time you're 75 years old. The payments cannot exceed more than one third of your disposable income. And the banks, the French banks are very conservative and they prefer salaried individuals rather than self-employed. But believe it or not, interest rates right now are well under 2%. They're actually about one and a half percent. I call it free money. And you know, you can invest your cash in a lot of other ways and make a lot more money than that one and a half to two percent that it's going to cost you to get a mortgage. So I still recommend trying to obtain a mortgage if at all possible, and we have the brokers to work with. Now, when it comes to renting out your property, so let's say you buy a property and you want to rent it out when you're not using it. The laws have become very, very restrictive. Um, the, law, the laws do apply to cities of a population of 200,000 or more, but every city has its own ability to enforce the law the way they want. When, if it's your primary residence, then it can be rented legally up to 120 days a year on a short-term basis. But if it's a secondary residence, then in Paris, the only possibility is a long-term one-year lease or what's called a mobility lease, which is one to 10 months to someone who's there on business or education. In Nice, however, you can do short-term rentals for up to six years, as long as the building itself approves it. So you have to be careful that the building allows the short-term rentals and you now have to renew this option every year, get permission from the city every year to do it. If you are caught with an illegal rental, the fines can be up to 50,000 euros. So it's not something you wanna do lightly. Now the purchase process takes quite a bit of time. It takes four to six months. And that's from possibly the initial visit of the property to the signing of the final deed. The seller tends to allow room only for about 5% negotiation. These are not hagglers. You cannot lowball an offer and expect the seller to be happy about that. In fact, they will easily walk away because they'll find it insulting. And it's very easy to know what a property is really worth because they do quite a lot of um, statistical information that's provided by the Chambre de Notaire and you can pretty much nail down what a property is worth. So you should know how to make an offer. But what's interesting is that the seller is morally obligated to accept asking price. So bidding wars simply don't happen. If you've got a hot property, you know you've got people behind you looking at it who could come in and do that. You might not wanna even take the risk of offering a lower price. Just go for the asking price it's yours. What happens at that point, once a price is, de is decided on, 
is you take this information to the notaire, which is the lawyer that manages the transaction. The lawyers are notified and they begin to pull all the necessary documentation together. It takes about one month. We recommend that you have your own notaire and not work with the seller's notaire. If the seller wants to work with your notaire, fine, but we like our clients to be represented uh, by their own notaire. And we work with a few different notaires that we've had um, uh, you know, experience with for many years. The first document that you sign is a pre-sale agreement and it's called either a promesse or a compromis de vente. There's a slight difference between the two documents. That is, when that is done, there's a 10% deposit that's get that gets held in escrow with the notaire. But all the due diligence on all the paperwork is done in advance of signing that agreement. We go through all the documentation with you. Once that document is signed, there is a 10 day cooling off period and you can actually retract your purchase completely within 10 days after signing the presale agreement. So there's a lot of consumer protection built in. From that point, you need to allow at least two to three months and often longer, especially with a mortgage, before signing the final act de vente or final deed. This is a long process. It's heavily bureaucratic. There are a lot of hurdles to go through. There are a lot of documents. They're all in French. They don't need to be translated because it's our job to ensure that you understand every single word of it. So in essence, we represent your interests only, not the seller's interests, the buyer's interests. We search for property on your behalf. We provide the resources and the professionals that we've been working with for years. We do all the due diligence. We advise along the way. And again, there's really no need for expensive translations, which can if you really insist on having these documents translated, you will spend thousands of euros doing that. So we manage the process from beginning to end. We act as a liaison. All you have to do is sit back and let us tell you what we need from you so that you don't have to think too much about it. And the bottom line is that we provide a kind of insurance because we refuse to let a client make a bad decision. We will do everything in our power to make sure that whatever property you buy is going to be the best investment you can possibly make. So on top of that, I like to think of us as a community. I mean, this is, you know, we, we are for Americans, by Americans, and we like to provide a lot more than just the property aspect of things. So we, offer three newsletters, which I call Nouvelle Lettre. It's a French word that I made up. Uh, I'm not sure how the Alliance Francaise will feel about that, but I registered this name. <laughs> we subscribe, you, we, you can subscribe to our three a week and you can unsubscribe at any time. You can also see us, of course, on House Hunters International. Uh, that is uh, uh, the episodes by HGTV, and we promote when they're airing. I have a uh, filming coming up at the end of this month. It will be my 47th or 48th uh, show that I've done. Hard for me to believe even now. We also offer a, a coffee gathering called Après Midi in Paris on the second Tuesday of every month, except for August, which always offers a speaker with a lot of interesting topics. So if you're in Paris, you can come and meet other people and enjoy our two hours of fun. We also offer conferences. We are doing a Living and Investing in France conference in Nice with a Tour de Provence in the fall of 2022. We just completed one this past September and it was so successful that we had a tremendous amount of interest in us doing it again. So we are doing it again next September. If you're interested in that, please email us. You can also book a personal consultation or a group consultation with me, which will get you off the ground. And of course, always participate in webinars such as this one, this one, and you can check our website for any upcoming events. 
So the truth is, it's really easier than you think. We have helped hundreds of people, maybe thousands. I haven't really counted, but I can tell you that my files are long and uh, thick. And uh, we've helped all these people make the move to France or invest in France or spend some part of their year in France. And it really just starts with this consultation to strategize how to do it in the best way to be the most successful. I always recommend you know, getting good advice, paying professionals to put you on the right path, whether it's me or someone else, don't do this alone. Uh, I also recommend not letting the fear of this get in the way of your dreams. Just put one foot in front of the other. And if you can replace the word expectations with the word hopes, oh, you will never be disappointed. And of course, prepare in advance by learning French. Uh, this gentleman who is singing, uh, this is a, a shot from a recent House Hunters International show. That is John Garland Jones. He moved to France, he moved to Nice. He had a dream to become a singer. He became a singer. He's still here years later. Uh, he has a big singing event tomorrow night here in Nice that we're all going to attend. And uh, if John Garland Jones can do it, anybody can do it. So on that note, I think it's time for a Q&A. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. This is our website. Here's an email address so that you can email us. And um, I'm going to let it go. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Adrian. That was a lot of information. And I saw that in the chat, Patty was very, very busy answering a lot of the questions that came up. But I think that um, we want to take some of those questions uh, uh, again, or, or in addition to what was covered in the chat. Patty, uh, can you get us going on that? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, one question that came through the chat for Adrian, I guess, I guess they're all for you, Adrian. Um, somebody <laughs> asked, why do you say that you can't ever go in reverse? Ah, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, because first of all, you can't, you're always moving forward. I mean, just physically you're moving forward. But once you have discovered this lifestyle and this other world, you will look back and you will see your life in a very different perspective. You're going to broaden the way you think about everything. And it's just impossible to go back to living with blinders on. Uh, I, it, it's a tough thing to explain, but I'll bet that if you ask every single American who has moved over here, they will say just about the same thing. That it's, you know, when you're in a situation, you don't know, you know, like living in the US, you don't even understand how life can be so different. For example, um, I'm particularly fond of cafe, cafe life, hanging out in the cafe, taking my computer, working away, communing with other people and not living in my bubble, the kind of bubble I used to live in. That change in lifestyle is just enormous. Um, I love the fact that I can get on a plane or a train and be in another country in a couple of hours. Uh, that's pretty tough to give up, things like that. So no, you can't go in reverse. What else, Patty? Okay. Um, I think we had more than one question about how big an issue is the wealth tax? Well, talk a little bit about the wealth how wealthy tax? you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, so wealth tax is not as much as one might think. The tax itself is not huge, but you don't pay tax twice on the same money. Keep that in mind. With good tax advice, with good tax advisors, you can really find ways to minimize that. Um, but quite honestly, after living in a socialist democracy and seeing how the playing field is level, more level, I don't really have that much sympathy for people who have huge sums of money, no offense, but how much money do you really need to live on is my question. And at some point, um, 
there's a point in the wealth tax and that supports this infrastructure we have in France that enables everyone to have good health care and everyone to have a quality education and everyone to have a good public transportation system. And so after living here 27 years, I quite agree with that. Okay, and on a somewhat similar political note, <laughs> somebody's <laughs> asking, Adrian, do you think that with the upcoming election, will a more conservative government, or it, I think this means if a more conservative government is put in place, will it become more difficult to buy property or live in France in the future? Well, that's one of those big what ifs, okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't believe in what ifs. Uh, I do think though that it's highly likely that uh, Emmanuel Macron, it will be reelected. I can't imagine that someone as conservative as a Marine Le Pen will uh, be elected. I don't see France doing that, quite honestly. They've tried pretty hard and they can't quite make the grade. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's a valid question. But uh, I'd rather live in the present. And for right now, things are just fabulous and hunky-dory. <laughs> I agree. I agree. <laughs> okay. Um, another question. Do you have any experience in Corsica? Oh, of course I do. Of course. <laughs> of course. Uh, Corsica is France. Corsica is my favorite place to vacation. It's absolutely beautiful. It's unspoiled. And I highly recommend uh, visiting it. Highly, highly, highly recommend visiting it. My favorite part of Corsica is the northern part between Calvi and Il Rus. Uh, the beaches are gorgeous. You can get to it by plane or by ferry. The food is fantastic. The wines are amazing. Um, uh, yeah, do it. Do what it. About, what about living there or purchasing property there? I think that's what uh, this is related to. <laughs> well, living there or purchasing property there is another story because you have to be a permanent resident of Corsica in order to buy property there. They don't really want transients. That's part of the reason it's unspoiled. And uh, the banks will give you mortgages to buy property there. And there are very few Americans. In fact, I think I can count them all on one hand and I know most of them. So I'm not sure that I recommend living there. It's also really dead for nine months of the year. It's very quiet. And then you're on an island. So, you know, it's kind of island fever. But hey, if you're living in Nice, you can go to Corsica all the time pretty easily. On the ferry. Yeah, <laughs> on or, the ferry. Or, or like twenty minutes. It's a twenty-minute flight. From yeah. the oh, that, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> it's a twenty-minute flight. To, yeah, it's hilarious. Yeah. Um, we have a question about the cost of living. Someone mm -hmm. is asking specifically about cost of living in Lyon versus Paris, but perhaps we can talk more generally just about the cost of living in France. Well, the cost of living is very, very, very reasonable. And the main difference in any of the cities has to do with housing. I mean, everything else is pretty much about the same. Yeah. Uh, we find that the cost of all major expenses are so greatly reduced, such as healthcare, uh, such as transportation costs, especially if you're using public transportation. Um, taxation, believe it or not, is I mean, you, incredibly less. Property taxes are about one-tenth of what they are in the United States. Um, the property tax I pay on my apartment in Paris, which is a two-bedroom apartment that is, you know, valued at over a million euros, and maybe I shouldn't be giving all this away, but the property <laughs> tax is 627 euros. <laughs> so, and I know that if that same property were in California, it would be more like $12,500. So, you know, I don't own a car. Um, it really doesn't cost very much to live here. And uh, I probably spend most of my money on eating out and sitting in cafes <laughs> than anything else. Well, and we could talk about like the price of your TV, internet, cell phones. Oh, thank you for reminding me about that, Patty. Yes. yes. 
Um, every client I talk to from the, especially, especially from the States complains that their uh, internet and their cable TV and their VOIP phones cost $200 a month and up. And that is a service that we have for, believe it or not, as little as $15.99 plus tax a month. Um, I just subscribed for a couple of properties we're working on this morning for literally 16 euros plus tax a month. And, it's in, and that's with fiber optic. Now I have a French cell phone that costs me another 16 euros a month for unlimited usage anywhere in France and free to almost anywhere in the world. And when I travel with it, it's free within the country I'm traveling and back to France. So when I go to the US, I use my French cell phone. I can use my personal hotspot so I can use internet wherever I am. And it doesn't cost me a penny more to do that, more than 16 euros a month. So that's the kind of benefit. Even utilities are much less expensive because everything is very um, economically oriented. The appliances are designed to be, you know, to use a lot less electricity. And so therefore they do, it's, there's just a lot less consumption in general and it's very inexpensive. It's amazing. It's amazing. Okay, another question we had is, how does one find an American community in an area? Hmm. Um, I would start with the internet. Basically, there are so many organizations and meetup groups just by surfing the internet, you'll find them very easily. There's a Democrats abroad, there's a, a Republican organization, there's international, uh, there's, um, oh my God, uh, ARO, A-A-R-O, Amer Association of Americans Retired uh, Resident Overseas. There's numerous organizations you can participate in. And then there's all these just sort of free form meetup groups. Even the, the monthly coffee gathering I do is a great way to meet meet up with other Americans. And um, it's pretty easy. Americans like to, they like to convene. They like to uh, organize and meet other Americans. And I find it very, very easy to make friends. If you're in Paris, it's particularly simple. Nice is even more amazing. And uh, the other communities are growing. You know, communities in Lyon, community in Bordeaux, community in Montpellier, Strasbourg, these American communities are growing and it's easy to tap into them. Okay, another question is, are house inspections included as part of the purchase process? Oh, that's a good question too. No, the house inspections are not done. The seller is obligated to provide diagnostics of the apartment or the building, and they are done by a licensed diagnostician, and they provide as much information as you can possibly get about a property, and therefore inspections are just not generally done. So uh, another quick question, where and what time is the monthly coffee gathering in Paris? And I'll put a link, I'll put a link in the chat too. Okay, second Tuesday of every month except August from 3 to 5 p.m. at the Café de la Mairie upstairs, which is on the corner of Rue des Archives and Rue de Bretagne in the third arrondissement. And there's a link to the website. And we have one coming up next Tuesday with Amber Johns who's an American, an international American lawyer, who I did a house hunter show with. <laughs> Great. Okay, let's see what else. Okay, somebody just asked, what about the homeowners association dues for apartments? Amazing, they're about <clears throat> 35 euros per square meter per year which is a, a loose average. 
Um, if a building has a guardian or an elevator, and if the heat is included or the water included, then those fees might be a little bit higher, but generally they're very, very reasonable. Yeah, very reasonable. The maintenance costs, the carrying costs on a property are like seriously <laughs> small, <laughs> very, very inexpensive. It's one reason so many of our clients are happy buying in France, even if they're not using their property that much because the carrying costs are so low. It's very easy. Yeah. Um, we had another question too, asking about down payments. If you're getting a mortgage, what's a typical down payment? Uh, well, if you're doing a mortgage, then it really depends on a number of different factors, and it could be anywhere from a 50 to 80% loan to value, meaning that your down payment will be anywhere from 20 to 50%. Okay, here's an interesting one. We're looking at moving to Paris in 2024. Will the Olympics affect the avail availability and price of rentals? It's entirely possible. Possible, yeah. Uh, it is very hard to know right now how the city is going to actually provide enough housing now that it has taken away so much tourist housing off the market because of the rentals. <clears throat> so quite honestly, <clears throat> I, my, I have, it, it's a guess. I really don't know. Yeah. Okay, and another question, if the realtors are so territorial, proprietary, how does your service find the properties for us if, we don't, if you don't have an office in Carcassonne, for example? That's because um, we know how to go about <clears throat> reaching the agencies that handle those properties. And we have a certain level of clout. When we go to an agent and say that we have a client who has hired us to find a property, they're gonna respect us a lot more than an individual who just calls up and says, I wanna buy that property that I see online. And, and because they know that dealing with a foreign buyer is a lot of work and a lot of handholding that they don't wanna do. So I've got a small story. We had a client who was interested in a particular property um, near X on Provence, no, near, near Uzez. <clears throat> and right. our agent physically drove to Uzez to look at this property, but the agent that was representing it didn't want to show it because the buyer wasn't there and didn't think that she'd have an opportunity to sell the property if the actual buyer wasn't there. And so uh, amazingly, our agent who's well-connected and got on the horn to other agents in the area, figured out where the property was and drove to the property only to discover that it had a for sale sign by owner on the property, contacted the owner directly, viewed the property. It was perfect for our client, made the offer. It was accepted and basically bypassed the agency entirely and so it saved our client a lot of money by not paying the agency commission. And that's the kind of work we do on behalf of our client. And Adrian wrote a newsletter about the story she just told you, and I put a link in the chat. Oh, thank you. If you guys want to read more about that experience, it's, there's a link in the chat. Okay. Maybe one last question or two. Um, we do have a question about how long does it take to get citizenship? Uh, well, from whose <laughs> perspective? Right. It takes a couple of years from the point that you apply. It's not an easy task, but they don't hand out citizenship very easily. You have to have had a carte de séjour or carte de résident for some period of time before they'll even entertain citizenship. I think it's five years. At least, um, mm -hmm. with the exception of if you're married to a French citizen. Right. 
Right. So it, it, it depends. I do not have citizenship. I only have residency. I was told by one of my uh, attorneys, one of my immigration attorneys, that the truth was I really didn't need it. The only thing that was going to buy me was the vote. And she didn't think it was worth my going to all the trouble, believe it or not. Yeah. So I didn't. <laughs> We're down to one minute, Patty. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you find properties in all of Paris, like in the outer suburbs? Do you have people interested in those areas? Well, we can find property anywhere, so that's not the problem, but it is true that we don't have too many um, of our clients interested in being outside of Paris. If you're outside of Paris, you're outside of Paris, and it really is a different life, and it could be the life you want, but um, most of our clients want to be inside of the 20, 20 districts. So we're, we're, at, we're on the hour. Um, maybe Linda wants to wrap this up. I'd like to thank all of you for being here and for all of your great questions. And we will try to possibly answer some of these questions in other mm -hmm. ways. Um, you can always also email us at info at adrianleads.com. Yep. Patty's the one who gets that. She'll be fielding some of these questions, but I see everything. So um, thank you. Thank you, Alliance Francaise. And Linda, you want to? Take yes. it over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian and Patty. Uh, we really appreciate your spending time with us and sharing your knowledge today. Um, I just wanted to remind the audience that we will have the recording of this event up on YouTube early next week. We'll send a follow-up link. And also we did have some requests to include the transcript from the chat. We won't have any problem with, with circulating that as well. So um, uh, we have kind of a tradition. Uh, if you'd like to take yourself off mute, and, and Melissa, I think you can uh, clear the flag so that people can take themselves off mute and applaud um, Adrian and Patty uh, for, their, for their help. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank